Hello everyone. Uh, this time around I want to talk about the notion of flying cars. Uh, particularly the kind of flying car that you often see in science fiction and, and uh, uh, sometimes fantasy even. Uh, and that could be anything from uh, something that looks like a conventional automobile but has flight systems as well as ground operations to a flying carpet like in Aladdin. Now, I don't actually think we will ever see a mass market flying car that gets any level of adoption. I have a couple of reasons for, for thinking that. Uh, first of all is operations, it just operating the thing. Um, if it's going to be operated by a human pilot, then you need to teach the operator how to navigate in three-dimensional space that is, they don't just have four back, left, and right. They also have up and down. You have to teach collision avoidance in three dimensions. Uh, and you have to teach a whole other set of rules for dealing with traffic in three dimensions. So as a result, I don't actually think we will have humans operating uh, flying cars uh, anytime soon, at least not on any particular scale. Uh, I could see uh, pilot's licenses of some description being issued for vehicles much like this, um, you know, uh, like they already do. And, and I think the uh, general uh, notion on how we deal with flying uh, vehicles is probably mostly on track. Although if they become a lot more common, we're going to have to come up with something a little more efficient than the pilot's license bureaucracy that we've got going on, especially given that a lot of the requirements for pilot's licenses are based around the notion of using airports and uh, uh, flying fixed wing aircraft and things like that. And a lot of those rules wouldn't necessarily even come into play. A lot of those situations wouldn't even apply for a flying uh, vehicle like the science fiction people tend to envision. Uh, and, and now I should probably describe what that vehicle basically looks like. Well, it's a vehicle that has a passenger compartment that holds probably two or four people like a common uh, sedan. It may even look like a sedan for nostalgia reasons, uh, or it might look like a Jetsons uh, flying car or something like that. Uh, and it can take off vertically and land vertically, and it can move in any direction from a hover, and it can hover. Now, in that situation, you don't need all of the business and dealing with air traffic control, flight plans, filing flight plans, uh, things like that. Uh, you don't need a lot of it. And you need less uh, concern for, uh, say, a medical situation uh, than you would for, a, say, a commercial pilot. But you still have to be concerned about it. Now... Operationally speaking, uh, humans are relatively good at operating in two dimensions. I say relatively good because we generally suck at navigation. Um, and navigation and collision avoidance uh, at any kind of speed, uh, which is why you often see single vehicle uh, crashes on highways and so on. We also get bored and our attention wanders and so on. Uh, now, that's less of a problem in two dimensions where stuff could be coming from behind you, in front of you, or from the sides, but it's not likely to be coming from above or below. Just like uh, oftentimes you can hide from people coming into a room just by being above them, because uh, people never look up, uh, people don't tend to look up when they're moving around, because we have evolved to move around on the ground, or close to it, so we're not likely having to deal with things coming from every which way. Now, you might think that uh, our ancient ancestors swung around in trees and so on, but I think you'll find if you really study 
the uh, history, you'll find that that isn't really so much the case. Sure, we our ancient ancestors may have swung around in branches and so on, uh, much like uh, some of us do today for fun, but we likely uh, weren't doing a lot of vertical separation. Uh, we wouldn't be going too far off the ground for safety reasons, right? Uh, the people going too far above the ground and falling would kill themselves and likely before they reproduce, so that wouldn't be a winning strategy. And certainly, socially, uh, that would have evolved out socially as well. So, uh, you know, we're, we're not really evolved for dealing with uh, uh, stuff whizzing around in with total freedom in three dimensions. And as a result, we're not particularly good at tracking what's going on in three dimensions. So I don't think that uh, humans will ever be particularly good in the general case at operating, say, a uh, flying car without actually having uh, uh, problems, uh, unless there are significant restrictions in the operations of those, those cars, such that they have to stay within designated air corridors, and, and instead of having two-dimensional lanes, we've basically got three-dimensional lanes, and we could probably deal with that, but again, probably not easily. And the question then becomes, what's the benefit of doing that? And you might think it re would reduce congestion, but really, would it? Because the people are probably still going to the same destinations. They're still going to have to park when they get there. So they're still going to have to be... So the, the Everything's all going to bottleneck to the same place anyway. So it's not likely that you're going to improve congestion because the it's bottlenecks. And and that cause a lot of the congestion. It's too much traffic going to one place or through one place. And just because that place happens to be three-dimensional and you can add 18, you can have 18 lanes by stacking six lanes three deep, it doesn't mean the traffic's going to move any better, uh, right? So uh, is it going to help with congestion? I don't actually think so. Uh, I don't think it'll make it worse. It might help in a few sp specific situations, but I don't think it'll help in the general case. And that's even leaving aside the fact that people will generally suck at operating these things. So un unless they have, we have good, solid autopilot, uh, I don't think these things will really be able to take off for the general population. And there's a whole other raft of issues with general consumption autopilots, whether that's for air vehicles, ground vehicles, or hybrid vehicles. Uh, that's a topic for another time. It's not an easy one. Now, uh, leaving aside the argument that humans suck at uh, flying things in general, uh, and leaving aside the regulatory nightmare of doing this, and uh, leaving aside whether autopilot is viable or not, because, because ultimately it will be, uh, the, there's another issue behind, that I think is the bigger showstopper that's going to completely stop this dead in its tracks. And that is the energy cost of flying. Now, if you're just talking about get up ahead of speed and use wings to generate lift and keep, and you know, that's not as bad bad from an efficiency standpoint and an energy usage standpoint as uh, as the uh, as a, uh, what what I'm going at here but the, the only way that works is an efficiency of scale where you're transporting a lot of people in one capsule and it has to be moving at speed and it, it needs a fair bit of in infrastructure and powerful fuel to make it work for a personal flying car, you can't be relying on airports and that sort of thing. That totally eliminates the, the benefit of it. Uh, you're basically down to a private jet or a private chopper, and th there's really no need to, uh, uh, to change how we handle that sort of thing, even if these specific vehicles change. How we handle them now is basically basically the right way to handle it. 
because they're, they're still going to have to take off and land in appropriate designated areas. And you have to have a pilot's license and all of that jazz, file flight plans as required, everything like that. Okay, so, uh, so basically, we definitely have to have uh, personal flying cars that work like science fiction shows us, where an ordinary person can get in, hover up, and take off. So if, if we're doing that, we need some sort of technology that gives us that vertical takeoff and landing and the hover. Now, we can't use uh, the rotors like a chopper because they're too big and too noisy, right? Uh, and I don't think we'll be able to use the same technology that's used in drones either because that's still rotors and it's still going to be noisy at a high power output. It's bad enough on low power output for low payload drones. Uh, okay, so you've got, we've got a problem there. Like we can get vehicles that go up and down and hover that and can move in any direction. We've got that, and uh, we know that works. But the technology we have for that is not practical for a passenger vehicle. Uh, it's, uh, you're going to need something akin to the, the strength of a chopper to, to do this, and for rotors, that's pretty big rotors. And as I said, that's noisy as well. And the reason you need that is because the vehicle's going to have to have a ridiculous number of safety precautions, and everything like that you add is going to add weight. So you, and then you have the weight of the payload, which is the passengers and their cargo. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, you've got the weight of the avionics itself, and then there's a good chance you're going to need a full ground transport system as well, which means a drivetrain, wheels, brakes, and you, you know, all of that, and all of the safety uh, measures that come from that come with that as well. So that means that you've got two complete drive systems in there, and you've added weight, you've added complexity, and now you've got to be able to uh, transition and you add even more complexity. It gets, and, and you have a lot of weight as well. Uh, so that means you need even more lift to get off the ground, which means even more noise with rotors. Now you might think, okay, well, why don't we use uh, aimable jets or something like that? And again, noise. And also there's gonna be that downwash from either method that's dangerous to those underneath it, uh, or cl especially close to the engines or the rotors. Uh, and for rotors, you need counter-rotating uh, rotors so that you don't, so you can offset some vectors and things like that, so you can maintain stability. And this is all leaving aside: how do you deal with uh, engine failure? Uh, you need, you know, the, that sort of thing. Uh, there's there's a whole lot of things that need to be considered. Uh, so what we really need to make this practical is some sort of anti-gravity hover system that is relatively quiet, uh, is relatively safe for anything that's under it, and can lift a heavy payload. Now, uh, don't get me wrong, if we can find something like this, that'd be absolutely brilliant. Whoever comes up with it is probably a multi-trillionaire. Because not only will we want to use it for terrestrial things like, um, you know, replace choppers and use it for cranes and things like that, and possibly uh, mass transit and even regular commercial air travel, but the space agencies would like to talk to you if you've got a solution to this, especially if it works outside the atmosphere, if it, if it works at altitude. Um, so if you can come up with one of these, uh, one of these... Stark Tech um, uh, widgets, uh, thruster thingies. Well, okay, great. Then you've probably nailed the biggest technical problem that, that a flying car has, as long as it can operate on a low enough scale. And as long as the power plant required isn't too ridiculous, uh, you know. And that's the other side of things. 
uh, when you're operating on the ground, the ground is providing the lift to keep you from sinking into the ground. The actual structure of the ground provides the force keeping you up. But if you get above the ground, the air doesn't provide that much of a force there at all. It does provide just a tiny bit, but it's negligible. Once you get above the ground, you have to have a force equal to the force of gravity to keep you in the air. Now, that force is going to be constant no matter what, what level you're at, assuming constant gravity, which it isn't quite, but eh, we'll fudge that. But you're going to need a force equal to uh, the gravitational pull to offset that. And then, of course, to go up, you're going to have to increase the force above that. To go down, you reduce it below that. That's easy enough. That's simple, basic physics. But you're going to have to be exerting that force continually to stay above the ground. And if you're going to be high enough up to avoid ground effect, then uh, you're going to have to provide that entire force yourself from your propulsion system. And the amount of force that you need to provide is going to be simply gravity product of gravity and the mass of your vehicle, including its payload, which includes the passengers. So the heavier the vehicle, the larger the force these thrusters, for lack of a better term, would have to provide. And that energy has to come from somewhere. You're going to have to provide it from somewhere. There is no way around that. So uh, this is where I think it fails. The energy required to keep such a vehicle in the air is simply not going to be worth it for the benefits that you may or may not get. Simply staying on the ground is going to be cheaper energy-wise. And we're already burning far too much energy just to have our modern life. So uh, we need to be looking at ways to reduce our energy footprint, not increase it. And flying cars are almost certainly going to substantially increase it. And that's going to increase smog and other pollution and heat and everything else. And we're going to burn through fuels faster. And generally, I think it's a bad idea for the general consumption. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't applications where such a technology would be a boon. And, and in those cases, it would, be, it would make sense. And, and quite frankly, uh, if we can crack it and get a, a good way to do this that doesn't involve massive rockets or jet engines or something, and is stable and can hover nicely, then great. Let's investigate it. But I, I don't think that the cost of operating a flying car is going to be practical for the the vast majority of the general population on the planet and i think it i think even the rich guys the really rich bastards out there that can literally heat their house by physically burning money and not even notice it even those guys are going to think twice about using this kind of a technology versus a typical company jet or a chopper because I think overall it's not going to be any cheaper and it's not going to be any more convenient uh, really when you get down to it. Uh, it's not going to be any more convenient than simply getting into a regular automobile and driving along the ground. Uh, it's you, you know, you might think that you could save by not having to maintain infrastructure for long haul travel and things like that, but uh, really, we don't spend that much on long haul infrastructure. Most of our infrastructure costs are in the dense areas where flying vehicles would be of dubious utility, simply because of traffic density, which is already bad enough. And if you add a third dimension to it, you, you just have that much more trouble from traffic congestion. So especially since it's gonna, you're still going to bottleneck to the same relatively small number of destinations. Uh, and as long as the traffic's going to a relatively small number of destinations, you're not going to help congestion in urban areas. So 
This is why I don't think, the biggest reason I don't think we'll ever have flying cars, and it's simply because they're not practical. Uh, they're not practical from an energy budget standpoint, and as it stands right now, they're not practical from a technological standpoint. And uh, leaving aside the possibility of a, a, a good, effective autopilot, uh, which will eventually happen, they're not a good choice for a biological pilot either, a, a human pilot, uh, not on a large scale. Most of us have enough trouble operating a motor vehicle in two dimensions on the ground. I'd hate to see the chaos we would inflict on ourselves if we went three dimensional. Still, it leads, it, it makes for some really impressive visuals in science fiction and fantasy. Um, the, these um, uh, flying cars, and they certainly uh, make certain aspects of storytelling a little less uh, inconvenient. But, uh, you know, so, if, so for visuals, they're great, but they're not really practical, I don't think. And if I'm proven wrong, great. Uh, if you're watching this 150 years from now and we've got flying cars whizzing around everywhere, hey, then I was wrong. But I really don't think I will be. Uh, I really, really believe that we will stick with plain old ordinary ground vehicles for the vast majority of our transportation simply because they're simpler, there's less that can go wrong, and, we, and they're easy to understand and the infrastructure is easy to maintain. Um, so there you have it. Uh, that's my uh, take on flying cars in the future. Basically, no, not going to happen. Uh, maybe some rich guys will have them, but not the general population. And you know what? That's perfectly fine. Uh, ordinary ground transportation works for, very well for most situations. A few things like ambulances and stuff could benefit from flying car type technology. But for the most part, it doesn't really matter. It, it's not that urgent that we get there 30 seconds faster. Anyway, uh, if you want to be notified of future videos, make sure to subscribe and enable that uh, notification thing, and that bell icon. If you liked the video or you didn't like it, leave a like or a dislike. Apparently it helps with exposure. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.